Hello, my name is Ben. And I'm Cammie. Welcome to the Fight for Together podcast. Today we're going to be talking about the importance of family. Now you got a little triggered right before recording this when I actually gave you the title of today's podcast, which was Family as the Primary Institution. (laughs) Yeah. Can you explain why? Um, I think that it, well, I know it's because I have have family and people in my past life that have used that lingo for, I feel like ways that have oppressed people, um, or at the very least it's been very narrow definition of what that means. And so when you said that, I was like, what are you going to get at with that? <laughs> um, because I just, for the last, I don't know, 15 years of my life or whatever, it's just been so hammered family teams or whatever. Family is the most important thing, da, da, da. And I'm just like over it at that, at this point. You're listening to the Fight for Together <laughs> podcast. So I didn't want to do another podcast that was about that, but you said it wasn't really about that, which I should have known better, but... Well, it kind of is and it kind of isn't. Yeah. I mean, I th- I guess, you know, I wasn't even planning on doing this, but we need to get into our story a little bit. Yeah. So the way we were raised, I think, was very traditional American, mm-hmm. which was... I mean, it's weird because people, I don't think people talk about this very much, but the number one most important role that you play in life is business, your business role. Yeah. Which is why you go to school. You go to school so you can get good grades, so you can get into college, so you can get a degree, so you can get a job, so that you can excel in business. Right. It's why women, I think, have been undervalued in our culture because historically, if you stay at home (laughs) and have kids, you don't have a paying job. So you're undervalued there Yeah. because people are like, what do you do? And you're like, I I stay at home. (laughs) I nurture children. Whoa. (laughs) Um, And growing up for me, it was extremely normal for our family to move around Mm -hmm. because of my dad's job. Yeah. Like we moved around for work. but and, Yeah. And my dad, for most of my growing up, had two jobs that took up a significant amount of his time. So working and business identity for males, and I think now increasingly for females, which I think is a great thing that there's equality, but... But it's just this thing that like you're supposed to excel in and if you don't excel in you're kind of like lower class human or something I don't know. Well, and this thing, like I said, it's it's not unusual for us to move our families to base our entire schedule. Like if I mm-hmm. um needed to do something and the family is like, hey, we want to do this thing. I'm like, it's such a valid excuse for me to say, I can't, I got to work. People drop that line all the time. Yeah. And it instantly insinuates priority. And this also happens with schooling. People actually move to a particular neighborhood or district so that they'll get the better school district. So it's like the same thing. It's just starting early. Yeah. Yeah. So then um, I would say about um, 10, 15 years ago, our priorities started to change. Now, I think what you were getting triggered by was the context through which it came Yeah, was largely from a spiritual context where in the Bible we were, well, we were be- being told the Bible was the ultimate curriculum for this and saying that right. family is super important. And certain people's interpretation of the Bible too. But what I found actually with the spiritual background we came from, and really just people in general, is people come to their conclusion they want to come to, and they use whatever sources are around them to validate it. Right. So if you're in a Bible group, 
you know, you like business, you're going to be like, the Bible says business is good. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Or if you like, um, goats, you're going to be like, look here in the Bible, there's these verses that say like goats are really great. (laughs) Um, and I think that's what was done to us with family, but having graduated (laughs) from (laughs) those spiritual communities, AKA getting kicked out. Yeah. Um, I still hold that belief that, that, um, but not for moral principles. Yeah. Um, but I would say that if you're going to devote your life to anything, I mean, not that you have to choose one thing, but yeah. in terms of prioritization, I think there's a strong case to be made across numerous indicator levels mm-hmm. that investing in your family, even if your family is just yourself. Yeah. Or if your family... And your family can be all different types of family. Yeah. Like there's not like a one, oh no, this is family type sock, shoe. Another way of saying it is your closest relationships. Yeah. Yeah. Which is really the basis for the name of Fight for Together Mm -hmm. versus the edicts of some boss whose goal is to increase a bottom line or shareholder value. Mm-hmm. And he's, or she, is looking out for his family, incidentally. Like, by, so it's kind of, well. Usually I'm, even indirectly. Yeah, I'm saying not like, not like probably very well, but it's just, yeah, it's just kind of interesting when you think about that. So I just want to paint a picture of like, you know, what our life used to look like. And it was that we would invest. What the? Oh. Hang on. Okay, that was scary. I think the memory card just got filled. Um, sorry, a little um, technical snafu. We are back. Um, where were we? Talking about putting more effort into your important relationships even if that's yourself or especially if that's yourself or it should be yourself then yeah then business so basically the tale that i see being told in america historically is it's validated to sacrifice everything for a business initiative and then what happens is you come home to your house and like I said, this is true if you're single or if you're gay or straight or have eight husbands or two wives or 20 kids or one kid. And whatever is at home, you then give your leftovers to. Like home is kind of seeing as just this crash pad recovery point to go back to business and work. Mm-hmm. Which is really fascinating in this time with COVID and quarantine, because for the first time for a lot of folks, home is all you have. Yeah. And I think I've been really excited to see some of the reciprocation or the, um, what's the word, the, the fallout in a positive way of what it's like for people to spend so much time at home with their family and kids they're having to assess things that they weren't assessing before. Are Mm -hmm. we eating in a way that we actually enjoy? Is our house, um, does it facilitate our goals? Mm -hmm. Um, Can we just like sit and watch TV for 18 hours straight? Or do we need to like create other places for activities or creation or production? Yeah. So... The other thing that I think you've already kind of stated this a little bit, but school is oftentimes just future work, you know, so we tend to prioritize it as well. And Mm -hmm. along with school probably comes like sports teams and other people's birthday Mm -hmm. parties and all these things that we give very high priority to um, school and work so that our home is really the leftovers. Mm -hmm. Um, And I wonder if part of that, is that all of those things like business, just what being really successful in this culture seems to be anything that can be tangible, 
like anything like a dollar amount like how much are you worth um did you win that award do you have so you have that award like all these like credentials and anything that's intangible like relationships is not as important and it's not really considered as success if those re- like if your relationships with your significant others or your kids or whatever are going really well and you've invested a ton into them no one's gonna well the masses are not gonna look at that and say wow I aspire to be like that person. You know what the irony is? The one thing that they do like it, look at, at least from the Christian world we came from, was number of years you're married. If you have like a 25-year oh, yeah. wedding anniversary, people will brag about that. Right. And they're like, it's basically saying, I haven't got divorced in 25 years, <laughs> which is like the equivalent of getting an award. Yeah. That's Even true. if you are... But again, that's tangible. Totally. That's what I'm yeah. saying. It's the only tangible thing you can latch on to. So even if you're in a totally codependent, destructive relationship, yeah, people still latch on to the one metric that's like measurable and they tangible. Can measure, yeah. And I wonder like if this is, if that's unique, if that's just like how humans are or if our culture is more unique that way than past cultures. I think we are unique because I think historically, um, first of all, there has been much, um, much more local living and operating. Yeah. So family was all you had. Family and your like immediate tribe. And you didn't have the masses like millions of people that could find out about you and and your success that just wasn't like a thing i mean so what's unique about this is you know we all talk about the dangers of globalization or um like you know not shopping locally is now becoming like a cool thing again Mm -hmm. but when you like buy everything from china and you don't support your local economy it creates a lot of waste um and excess and you know it's bad for the environment there's all sorts of issues with it but the same phenomenon occurs even like kind of in a local way when you know what happens when your kid spends eight hours a day with a teacher that you've never met mm-hmm. or you spend 12 hours a day with a boss that your kids don't even know mm-hmm. there's there becomes all sorts of like breakdowns fragmentation yes yeah where relational equity used to be a primary motivator mm-hmm now it's kind of like you know how when you shop on amazon like the biggest driving factor is like well well, i don't care really how it's ethically sourced Mm -hmm. the way the way amazon kills it is just like is it cheaper Mm -hmm. and is it easier and in a lot of ways with our kids and grades and whatnot i think it's like i don't care who the teacher is i don't care what's like really happening are they getting good grades and are they going to be prepared for the future okay all these are this is like a giant tangent but i want to come back to one area of like proof i guess i would say if you want to know what you care about is to look at your budget Mm. what are you willing to spend on both with money and with your time yeah and that's how you can tell I know for work historically, like if I needed a new computer for work, it was like, oh, done. Obviously, I have to buy it, like because I'm going to use it to make money. Yeah. But if my kids wanted a computer to learn to paint, I'd be like, you don't need a computer. (laughs) (laughs) Just start painting. Yeah. All you need is paper. (laughs) Use your blood if you have to. (laughs) But I, daddy, goes to work, and Mm -hmm. I that's important. Like, I put a roof over your head and food in your mouth, so. Which there is something to be said for putting a roof over the head, over your, your head, but I think it's gotten so crazy to a point where we all have roofs overhead, and we don't know why we're working anymore. We just are ingrained with this prioritization. And I just want to point out kind of a few anecdotes um, about why I believe that it's um, better to invest in your family than just a boss. Or I don't want to say, I don't want to paint it as an either or. 
because I think we can honestly do both. Yeah, because sometimes investing in yourself is investing in your business or a business or a trade or a degree. Like those things can very, very much be something that um, is good for you. But I do think some a lot of times we get get lost in that. And I would like to see the prioritization increase of your values and your home's values. And one story or anecdote I have is at people's grave sites, um, either when they're dead and you're at their funeral or right before they die, what do people say they wish they did more of? And I think universally, you never hear someone say, I wish I had sent more email or made more money or made my boss happy or inv invested into carbon fiber infrastructure or computer development. Almost always what they say is, I wish I had spent more time investing into my children or relationships. Yeah, it seems to all have to do with connection. And kind of a weird cousin to that is a story when we were on the Appalachian Trail hiking with our six kids, which is like kind of our ultimate investment into family time. Um, the people that the most consistently came to us do you want to share the story? I don't know what you're going to say. Uh, so, no. Okay, well, <laughs> interrupt then when okay. you want to. The people that most consistently would come to us and again and again say, wow, I think what you're doing is really great are older people. Oh, yeah. Whose mm -hmm. lives had lived out. Some of these people, I got to imagine a lot of them had been very successful in business and they had mm -hmm. had massive amounts of success financially with um you know promotions and job titles and all this stuff mm -hmm. and the thing that they said was i wish i had done more of this with my family when i was your age mm -hmm. i mean how many times did that happen on the appalachian oh, trail a, a ton <clears throat> seems like maybe almost yeah. every day yeah and it was always <clears throat> which makes sense, but it was always people that were older than us, like in their 50s or 60s. Because for some reason at this age, business feels so damn important. Yeah. Which should be a red flag. That the older people don't feel that way yeah. anymore? Yeah. I mean, because, and I have this like intrinsic... I just think it's dangerous when something feels more urgent than it actually is. Mm -hmm. Like I think of this about my phone. Like Instagram feels urgent all the time. I feel like I got to check this. Yeah. If not, I'm going to be missing out or something. Right. But it's fake urgency. Yeah. And it's that's a small picture. But on this big picture thing, business feels so urgent. Mm -hmm. You know, no one ever gets like busted or called out because you're not really like hanging out with your kids enough. Mm-hmm. You could be a terrible parent, but if you're killing it in the financial world, people will envy you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So a few more, like, um, just like three observations that I made as to why investing in closest relationships to you are is a very valuable use of your time, is it's actually the best ROI, Okay, ROI stands for return on investment. Mm -hmm. As an investor, you're always kind of looking for, if I put $100 here, what am I going to get back? Mm -hmm. Or 100 hours. And, you know, investing in your business can be good in a way, but businesses fold, bosses move on. Chances are, like, you're pretty disposable or replaceable, either by another employee or by, as Amazon is showing, automation, robots, or large-scale companies and people that work in India. So many people are just, and industries are being swallowed up and replaceable. So if you invest thousands of hours into a job, mm -hmm. most a lot of jobs people are finding, they can just be replaced and they can go away. Yeah. More than they'd like to think. Yeah. But with family, this is not the case. 
I mean, when you invest in your kids, these are the people that more or more than likely are the only people that are going to be there to take care of you Mm -hmm. in 40 years. Yeah. Or they're the only people that will actually just plain be there in 40 years. I mean, on a relational level, I've had all sorts of like best friends and community on spiritual levels that we've invested hundreds of hours, thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars into, not exaggerating. Yeah. I mean, if you want to hear more about it, you can listen to our story on our Everyone Belongs podcast. And most of those people I have not talked to in four years. Yeah. Like not even, I have not heard a word from. Right. And I think in a way that was our equivalent of business. work and business. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. Church business. Um, and now, if I could do it over again, I would not invest as much there. I would invest more into time with my kids, who are still around, by the way. Yeah. Um, okay, the second reason why I think investing in family is important is because I think there are the best learning opportunities for growth. So, you know... Yeah, there's plenty to learn at work. Like you can learn about, you know, all sorts of trades and skills. And mm-hmm. um, and I don't want to shit on that. I don't want to say it's not important. Yeah, but you can kind of still keep uh, a foot in the door with business. Like you can kind of keep people at bay um, to a certain degree. So, but with family, you it's a lot harder to do that. Um, your true self comes out more. And so I think there's, there are more opportunities to work on yourself or deal with your own issues in those relationships. And I'm sure there's some in business, but most business relationships are probably set up to be at least pretty shallow. And I'm just going to drop one little (laughs) nugget here, although I think this could be a whole podcast in itself, which is I learned a while ago, whatever it is you don't like about your kids is probably actually something that's more about you than it is about them. Yeah. Yeah. So if you use these little, you could call mirrors or little information sources that are our kids to learn about what it is that we have incompleteness or character deficiencies or woundings or trauma or various things in our own life, if we were to actually take that seriously, I think it presents the greatest source of healing and growth in our entire life, at least in my experience. And the areas that I've used to change personally because of my children and family relationships have had more of an impact on my business Mm. ventures than anything else also so when you when you fix or heal or grow personally it changes everything in your life including your business decisions Mm -hmm. it's the same person making the parenting decision as the business decision so if you have Mm -hmm. um, a certain blind spot in a business world or in the parenting world it's going to impact both areas yeah so if you can solve it or grow through it or fix it it will make you more money, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Maybe. I mean, I think a, a big reason why people don't invest more in family is because if you invest more in family, it's, your art is going to take away from your business. Yeah, no, I mean, I hear what you're saying. I, I mean, guess I what I mean is both. like on a decision by decision basis. Yeah. Because I think I spend less money in business than ever, but the time I do spend yeah. I find to be more, I'm more mature businessman. Yeah. So I'm more productive yeah. and more. So maybe in the long run, you are making more money or, you know, but it, in the short, like in your face, you probably would think, oh, well, no, I'm going to be losing money because I'm spending more energy, more time now with family instead of business. And the final um case for me as to why we ought to do this or at least consider prioritizing family more is i think it's more rewarding and this is evidenced by the types of people that say what they say at the gravestone and at their final breaths you know um some of the people that have invented the most magnificent things i mean steve jobs said that his biggest regret is not spending more time with family 
And I just think there's a level of satisfaction that comes from intimacy and relationship that every time you invest in your family, you are investing in that thing, which is a, a, a pretty permanent thing as far as permanence goes. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, companies get bought and sold and people get fired and hired mm-hmm. all the time that I've found that the amount of effort and energy I've invested into my family I, I think, I mean, making millions of dollars in business and landing clients and deals, it was fun, but it was also um, pretty fleeting, like in the grand scheme of things. Hmm. Okay, so we are going to finish this podcast by talking about, let's see, three suggestions if you want to start to shift this prioritization. <clears throat> And maybe a better way to pitch this is you don't even have to like deprioritize business. Like I don't want to take that off its throne. I'm not trying to like say business is worthless or whatever. Mm-hmm. But I I would like to see people increase the amount of prioritization that happens in family. And sometimes when you find that you're being satisfied by <clears throat> kind of like bigger and better goals and more and getting rewarded more in family than you were, you might find that a lot of what you're investing in business now feels kind of unnecessary. Hmm. Cause I think a lot of times and I'm going to generalize just cause this is what I've heard more from male and my male friends is business is the place where you feel the most satisfaction. Mm-hmm. You feel the most rewarded for your efforts. You get, you get recognized. Mm hmm. Or it's also maybe what you're naturally good at. Like maybe you were never taught how to share your feelings, but you don't need to know how to do that in business as much. But if you can start to um, find ways of achieving satisfaction at home, I think sometimes it just like naturally starts to taper off of seeking that type of significance in the business world. At least that's what I found. Okay, three suggestions. Number one, budget your time. Okay. Um, we do this with business. Most businesses require a certain number of hours and even schedules. So they say 40 hours a week. That's what we pay you for. You need to show up or work 40 hours. You need to show up at nine. You need to be here until five. Mm -hmm. And we're like, yeah, no problem. We like Mm -hmm. sign me up. We agree to that all the time with business with home. Like I said, usually home just receives leftovers. So it's like, okay, I'm at work from 9 to 5, and then when I'm done, I go home until I need to go back to work. That's how Mm -hmm. it's seen. Yeah. Which is a really shitty way to invest into something is be like, okay, I'm going to do whatever is leftover with Mm -hmm. my time. Yeah. So – one way to prioritize it is to proactively decide what time you want to spend with certain things at home. This could be relationships with kids, relationship with partners and spouses, relationship on personal projects and goals. Mm-hmm. Uh, example that I just thought of when we first got married, I was going to nursing school and we had uh dove who was just not even a year old and you worked at red robin as a server and you would purposefully get certain shifts so that you could watch dove while i was at school and that actually meant you at times like taking less pay because you would do like the not as high volume shifts which was lunch yeah. So you would not do lunch. And no, I would do lunch. Or, oh, right. You would I wouldn't do, do lunch. Dinners. Yeah. And we would trade off that way. But I think that's interesting. Like, he, even back then, as a 22 year old, you, you invested and you valued that. Even though you knew you would make more money, you know, not doing that, you wanted to be around Dove um, more. I think that's cool. 
She was pretty cute back then. <laughs> the second thing you can do is budget your money. Hmm. So, I mean, just like um, we said, if there's a computer for work, it's like a no-brainer purchase. The reason why you buy the computer for work is because it gets done what you want it to get done. But a lot of times, um, our goals at home, well, if it's just survival, we kind of invest like the bare minimum, Mm -hmm. like financially. And I think it's kind of sad. Like, I think our homes could actually be designed better. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, I think if you came came at it with a blank slate, let's say, let's say you, you don't even factor in the job you have right now, but you, you just say, if I could do, if I could invest this many hours into home and this many hours in, like you just decide, you're like, I want to invest 40 hours into home, 30 hours into work. And then with money, you could do the same thing. I want to invest um, $300 a week into home, $200 a week into work or whatever it is. Um, instead of, cause I think what happens is why home gets the leftovers is business. Those like, we just automatically think, well, that needs to come first. Yeah. So, and you know, it sucks. The only two times, not the only, but the main two times I hear people investing in home is when they want a new kitchen and they think the old one just looks like crap. So they're making mm-hmm. a new kitchen just to like kind of fit what they think would best go in a magazine. Mm-hmm. And not that can be fine too because I do think you should enjoy being in your home, but I don't think you should just make your home look nice for other people. Mm-hmm. And the second people reason people invest in their home is just to increase its resale value, yeah, which is a shitty reason. In terms of, I mean, it is a financial benefit, but that's the only benefit. Like, Mm -hmm. there's a whole, there's so many. Again, you're doing it for someone else. Yes. There's so many other reasons to invest in your home for yourself. Mm -hmm. Like, what will help you, what will inspire you creatively? What will make you want to release your gifting and your art? What will make you more fit and help you achieve your health, diet, and fitness goals? What will make you just want to be home more? What will help your relationships and give you alternatives to just isolated activities like Netflix and video games? Um, What brings people together? You know, Mm -hmm. I mean, we've invested, I think recently, like we invested about $10,000 into our backyard this last year, like Mm -hmm. creating this patio area with this gazebo. And it seemed like so much money. It was like 10000 bucks that we're never going to see a cent back from from reselling the home. Mm-hmm. So that's when it feels like a waste because I've been programmed to think, oh, if this doesn't increase my house's value, then you shouldn't invest in your home. But if it increases other values, like your your value of life or your, what's the word I'm looking for? like Quality of life. Quality of life. And it has. We've spent so much time... But no one's going to say like, oh, that's worth $10,000. Like, because we can't measure it. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. The final thing that you can do, one is budget your time. Two is budget your money. Three is have a meeting. Okay. And we've pushed this for a long time by showing you guys in our vlogs what this looks like. But I have found that for a long time, the goal of family was survival. Mm-hmm. You need to not die, like literally from the elements or from starvation. So families, you know, that was their goal. Mm-hmm. Well, we live in a different age where survival isn't our primary thing. Most people are not starving to death that are listening to a podcast on a $500 phone mm-hmm. right now. But without replacing the vision of survival and just still having survival, mm-hmm. we get bored because we have nothing better to live for. So what kills us isn't not surviving. It's actually fighting over silly, trivial things at home and boredom. That's what, like, I think a lot of home life and our home life for a lot of years was really characterized by. It was, like, boring, you know? So Mm -hmm. I was more excited to go to work because I felt like I was conquering 
growing, expanding, building, developing. But I think that those types of things can be done at home with the family. In fact, I think they're better. I just think it takes some imagination and development. They're not going to happen on accident. Yeah. And you're not going to have people patting you on the back. It's not going to be like instant gratification. Like I think a lot of times business can be more that way. Yeah. Like you don't have a boss saying, good job. And this was like, you know, I mean, we experienced this on the Appalachian Trail, though. I mean, sometimes they'll pat you on the back. Because if you do things like, you know, our family has taken on projects like running marathons or traveling, Mm -hmm. doing trail magic on the AT or even hiking the AT. But those types of um, projects required vision casting and planning. Mm -hmm. But what I saw happen was the kids got excited. Mm -hmm. We got excited. Then we started investing our time and energy and money and our resources And it brought us closer together and Mm -hmm. gave us something very fulfilling to live for. Yeah. But that was all done through the home. It wasn't done through a church or club or business. Mm -hmm. And I don't think, you know, those are crazy extreme examples, like a six month trip away from home. Yeah. But you don't need to start with that. You can start with, you know, um, a room in the house, say, hey, this room is not being used right now. Mm -hmm. How can we turn this room into a place where we all want to be? Who has some ideas? And maybe it takes a weekend and $1,000. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Or the yard. How can we turn our yard into a place that we get excited to be at since we have this whole summer ahead of us? Yeah. Um, Or a weekend. Like, hey, we want to spend a weekend and 500 bucks to bring the family closer together and to have an adventure and explore. Mm -hmm. Where can we start with that? Those are all things, but they will not happen when you're prioritizing work and you show up at home at 5.30 p.m. completely burned out. And the only next thing you're looking forward to is work again on Monday. And you just give home your absolute leftovers. Mm -hmm. Doesn't sound very nice. I feel like I could do like a... Give myself a little round of applause there. Yeah. Um, So the final thing is to set bigger goals, to have a meeting um, with whoever is in your leadership. Okay. A lot of what I'm describing here is from this book that I wrote called Unleash Your Family, Chaos to Creativity in One Week. And I lay out how we did this for our family in a one week process that I think is replicatable. I believe it's replicatable because I hear of a lot of people doing it. Mm -hmm. Um, This book takes less than an hour to read. It's available on Amazon as a paper book, as an ebook, and I believe as an audio book by now. Oh, really? Well, I'm assuming that it it will be by the time. Yeah. Yeah, (laughs) right. That'll be your book. I'm talking to future Cammy. Yeah, Not, can't. it'll be your voice, right? Yeah, mm. which so you can listen to it, Cammy, if you just want to go to bed and you miss me. Yep, when you're right, um, always right there, anyways. <laughs> it's kind of ironic because I'm supposed to read these things um, to boost my qualifications. It was a number one bestseller in personal you transformation. Want me to do it? Well, no, I'll read this one. It was okay. a number one bestseller in time management and business. Whoop whoop. Oh, which Black. is kind of oh, Black. right there. Yeah. Well, I, I just was pointing out it's kind of ironic that it became a number one bestseller in time management <laughs> business. and business <laughs> yeah. when it's more or less like anti telling you to like, but it, it's telling you to business. use business principles at home. Yeah. So that's why. Yeah. And it's a number one bestseller in two hour parenting and relationship short read. So I, I do hope you check it out. And if you do check it out, I would love it if you would leave a review. Um, that's it for now. If you're interested in more of this, um, thanks for listening, guys. This podcast is available on iTunes and um, like Google Podcasts and Spotify, and it's also available on YouTube if you want the video form. Mm-hmm. That's All it. All right. We will see you guys later. Next time. Thank you for listening to Fight for Together. We'll see you next time.